Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. I know there's a, a lot of wisdom that has been shared in this space so far, yes? Can we give a hand for all the panelists and all the people that are doing their work? It's been really beautiful and powerful to, uh, to be a part of this. Uh, my name is Dr. David Alexander. I'm the senior pastor at New Thought Center for Spiritual Living in Lake Oswego. And I'm the moderator for this panel this afternoon. I also serve as the chair of the Leadership Council for Centers for Spiritual Living, director of strategic alliances, and also a member of the Leadership Council and Board for the Association for Global New Thought, where our president, uh, Dr. Michael Beckwith, was among the panelists uh, at the Parliament of World Religions in Salt Lake City. This afternoon on uh, challenging hate and violence, I think uh, so many of the other panels have already uh, referenced the ways in which uh, religious hate speech or religious-based uh, discrimination of one form or another is at the root of so many of the world's challenges. So we're excited for this panel to begin to discuss how we can uh, challenge that, how we can dismantle that, how we can address it in our society and the ways in which we see it. So I'm going to quickly tell you who I have up here with me. They'll give a little bit more full bios of who they are and their backgrounds as they uh, begin their piece. Uh, but I'll just quickly tell you who they are and then we'll watch some videos uh, from the parliament. We have two. I think one is a, uh, uh, a piece that the parliament did on this topic. And then the second is one of the speakers, Dr. Lawrence Carter, who's actually a dear friend of mine uh, from Morehouse College, and his presentation on, uh, a snippet of his presentation on this topic. So we have uh, Joni uh, Levin? Levine uh, from Compassionate Listening. We have Harris Zafar from the Muslim community. Welcome, Harris. We have Sat Human uh, from the Sikh community, and Dr. Sharif Abdullah from Common Way Institute. Yes. So again, you'll hear more about uh, the background of each of these wonderful individuals as they uh, present in that order right after these uh, short videos. Look around. There are more than 50 armed conflicts being waged across the world. An incalculable number of hate crimes and an overwhelming amount of hate speech. Over 60 million refugees have fled the terrors of war to neighboring countries. And an ongoing human tragedy that shows no signs of abating. Physicians for Social Responsibility, a Nobel Peace Prize winning organization, estimates that in just the last few years, five countries have been destroyed by conflict. Peaceful members of ethnic and cultural groups are ridiculed and persecuted for simply being who they are. Religion is often blamed. And yes, religion has played a role in creating these conflicts. Extremists everywhere have distorted its teachings to justify their acts of terror. The media, professors, and powerful individuals often suggest that religion is the villain. But religion and faith are also leading a movement to resolve these conflicts. Humanity's ability to be compassionate and loving is greatly underestimated, and these attributes are strengthened by religious values across the world. By focusing our efforts on the positive side of human nature, our compassion and selflessness, we can begin to bring these conflicts to an end. It is the part of our nature that searches for justice and peace among those who would otherwise be our foes, that protects those who cannot protect themselves, and will not stand idle and watch what we love die. It is the part of our nature that seeks the truth, 
and recognizes that religion can bring us closer to what we all strive and yearn for. A more just and peaceful world. Look around. Around you today are some of the smartest and most compassionate people in the world. Together, we can create a more just and peaceful world. speech, our consciousness toward another person, you are not free. And if you express the H word in private, remember that the right to privacy does not include the right to hypocrisy. I'm speaking about H-A-T-E, don't say it. Naming it is too easy. If you name it, the likelihood is that you will waste time condemning it or justifying it. But if you take it into your heart, the likelihood is that you can transform it. The active part of nonviolence is love, said Gandhi. Love is the route to transforming the H word. Be disturbed by it. Discover, see, and understand the origin of it. Become very intimate with it. Study it. Look at it. Go into it. Discover the implications of it. It is the root of violence, war, and innocent suffering. If we're going to free ourselves and others from the effects of the H word, we must be willing to go beyond anger, nationality, violence, and exclusive religions. We must stop condemning and justifying the H word. We don't have enemies. We have friends with different definitions of experience. In our very diverse world, tonight I charge you to make a commitment to inclusivity. Make an irrevocable covenant with the humanity of the world make a determination to protect the inherent dignity of all people without exception. Co-create a dignitarian global society. To achieve this, you need a larger address than where you were born. A big vision is required. Hence, I charge you to live in Mahatma Gandhi's global village, in Martin Luther King Jr.'s world house, in Nelson Mandela's international solidarity of peace-loving nations, in Daisaku Ikeda's global commonwealth of citizens, and in Fedela Gulen's global civilization of love and tolerance. 
I charge you to create a revolution of character and a chain reaction of empowerment on the World Wide Web by expanding your internet friendships across differences. I charge you to collect the emails and names of five or more people from different religions at the 2015 Parliament. Counter, challenge the 11 and a half thousand H-word websites found internationally. Challenge those websites with internet sadaragaha, internet agape, internet unconditional love, internet compassion, internet tolerance, internet nonviolence, and internet forgiveness. Look around. And now we'll hear from our panel on not only this topic, but how to address it. Thank you. So I am a facilitator with the Compassionate Listening Project, which was founded by Leah Green, a Jew, um, with the assistance of Jean Knudsen Hoffman, a Quaker, who had studied with um, Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. Um, my partner, Yehuda Winter, and I um, have facilitated trainings in post-genocide Rwanda, in Uganda for the Abu Daya Jewish villages, and numerous basic intensives here in Portland. Um, we taught the skills on the 31st Compassionate Listening Delegation to Israel and Palestine this past November. Um, and develop conversation cafes in the hopes of broadening people's perspectives on this conflict. Um, we're off to Indonesia to present and assist at the Alternatives to Violence Center in Java. And before we leave, we're conducting intensives in New York City and at the Trillium Hollow co-housing community here in Portland. So let's begin with a heart meditation centered on self-compassion. We cannot truly be compassionate towards others until we can be compassionate towards ourselves. So please settle yourself in your chairs, close your eyes, or lower them in a soft gaze. Gently bring your attention to the interior of your heart. Experience its spaciousness. In this place, the tides of life flow, bringing energy and vitality to you. Rest here in this most intimate and energetic spot. This is the place of compassionate listening. Anchor yourself here in the core of your being, sending love and forgiveness to yourself. Please now open your eyes, stretch up your arms, silently look around the room, taking in all the amazing people around you, participating together in creating a heart-centered energy field. Feel it. Now put your hands down, please. Positive emotions produce a strong, orderly electromagnetic field and can shift the EM fields of others close by. Meaning, when we are anchored with positive emotions in our heart, our feelings are literally contagious. Just giving your heart undivided attention will produce these effects. Monks that daily practice holding compassionate thoughts have the strongest measured EM fields. James Twyman is currently conducting world-synchronized meditations using these same principles. 
So what does this have to do with challenging hate speech and violence? Conflict creates inner wounds that remain unhealed until acknowledged. Unhealed inner wounds can lead to a spiral of ever worsening problems that can harden into a personal identity story that spawns more hatred and violence. Unhealed inner wounds of both victims and persecutors can become narratives that justify retributory violence, creating a never-ending drama triangle. Hearing each other's stories reveals these unhealed wounds and allows for mutual compassion and understanding. We don't shy away from strong feelings, but rather welcome their honest expression and intensity. We need to stay anchored in our hearts in order to create a safe space in which this can happen. The challenge embedded in this approach is to listen to the other, the enemy, with the same degree of openness, non-judgment, and compassion that we bring to those with whom our sympathies lie. In this context, an enemy is one whose story we have not heard. On the compassionate listening delegation to Israel and Palestine this past November, 19 delegates, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, and atheists, met and listened to people on both sides all of whom had lost family, friends, and neighbors to violence. Some had previously engaged in violent tactics themselves. Most all felt strongly about the futility of violence. People are often surprised to learn that each side's fear competes on a level playing field with the other. Getting to know the other, learning to trust the other, requires meeting the other. For a lot of reasons, that almost never happens these days in that region. Most everyone is traumatized. In challenging times, perhaps the most courageous act is to meet and humanize. On the journey, I kept looking for who might be the Mahatma Gandhi of the conflict. Two people in particular stood out. Jamal Mekbeel, a Palestinian member of Roots, a joint Palestinian-Israeli organization based in the West Bank, and Rabbi Arik Asherman, former director of Rabbi for Human Rights. Jamal was arrested by the Israeli military multiple times, tortured and humiliated. In choosing to be a peace activist, in choosing to meet with Israelis, he lost his work and stature in his community. Here's an excerpt from his listening session. I am afraid when I am here now, especially these days. I am afraid, but this does not mean I will close my doors. We continue to try. My courage comes from my pain. I think the pain must push us and teach us to end the conflict. If we know the pain, I think it is easy to find the medicine. Palestinians and the part of my family in Al Arub refugee camp, they have a lot of pain. Yet Jamal continues to be active. We need to use the pain to charge our batteries. Now, I will not talk about two states or one state or about the borders. I talk about humans. To end the blood, to stop it. Our kids, our life. We need to look in the mirror. My mirror is my kids. When I see that my kid is afraid, this is one of the reasons that opens my heart more and more. Rabbi Arik protects Palestinian farmers so they can harvest their olives, has stood in front of bulldozers with Bedouins to prevent house demolitions, and frequently finds himself in court. He speaks of being a new Zionist, one who works to repair the situation Jews have created in Israel. Some words from his transcript. Last week, a Jewish, Jewish settler tried to stab me three times while I was working in the fields. He was only 17. What is this greenhouse that is growing people like this? We are family. We shouldn't be fighting. We are all struggling for the land that Abraham bequeathed us. We should be spending that energy to mirror the integrity and morals that he also bequeathed us. Personally, as a Jew, I feel great shame about Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. 
It was difficult to listen to a settler couple who were almost killed when a boulder was thrown at their car window while driving home. I felt my heart harden as I listened to their story. For me, they were the enemy, settlers. I witnessed my own judgments and sought ways to connect. It's all about treating each other as human beings. Let's conclude by entering two abodes of the Buddha, loving kindness and compassion. Please, in silence, face someone near you. If you find yourself alone, please simply face your own self. So please do that really quickly. So everyone, once you're facing someone, please close your eyes, breathe, exhaling any tension. Open your eyes in soft focus and look upon your partner's face. If alone, keep your eyes closed. If you feel discomfort, note it with patience and gentleness and come back when you can to regard your partner or yourself. Open your awareness to the gifts and strengths that are in this being. There are behind those eyes unmeasured reserves of courage and intelligence, of patience, endurance, wit, and wisdom. There are gifts there of which even this person is unaware. Consider what these powers could do for the healing of our world if they were to be believed and acted upon. Silently wish this person be free from fear, be released as well from greed, from hatred and confusion, and from the causes of suffering. What you are now experiencing is loving kindness. Close your eyes now, rest into breathing, taking a moment to absorb this awareness. Open your eyes again, if with a partner, look into those same eyes and let yourself become aware of the pain that is there. If alone, focus on your own pain. There are sorrows accumulated in that life as in all human lives, though you can only guess at them. There are disappointments, losses, and loneliness. There are hurts beyond the telling. Let yourself open to that pain, to hurts that this person may never have told to another human being. You cannot take that pain away, but you can be with it. As you draw upon your capacity to be with your partner's suffering or your own, know that we, what you are experiencing is compassion. It is very good for the healing of our world. Closing your eyes now, Rest into breathing. Take a moment to absorb this awareness. Open your eyes now. Thank your partner or yourself silently and center yourself ready for the next speaker. Good evening, everybody. As we all kind of come back to our own realities, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Harris Zafar. I'm a member of the uh, Ahmadiyya Muslim community. It's a uh, particular uh, organization or community or sect of Muslims. Um, I serve as national spokesperson for this uh, said community. Uh, stands as the uh, oldest and longest lasting Muslim organization in the United States, established back in 1920. Uh, we built and we operate the Portland Rizwan Mosque, which is not terribly far from here. It's in southwest Portland. Um, not the largest, but uh, certainly historic in the sense it was the first mosque ever built in the city of Portland. Uh, and so always have an open door and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to meet some of you in the future there as well. Uh, it is an honor to be included in this panel, uh, albeit we were just dubbed as the uh, violent and hateful group. 
Um, so thank you to my uh, native friends for that. Um, uh, but um, but why, uh, the reason why it's so uh, much of an honor to be part of this conversation is because the development of peace has become perhaps the most uh, pressing issue uh, of our time. And that term peace really transcends um, so many different areas because fear and disorder have really engulfed the world. Uh, armor and uh, ways of conflict have now become commonplace in different areas of the world and even here in the United States. Uh, violence is used as a way of settling differences Terrorism is being meted out um, due to some perverted uh, view of one's faith. Terrorism is being meted out at the, uh, at, the, at the claim of fighting terrorism. And ultimately, we as human beings feel a certain sense of discomfort. Uh, and that discomfort is really what's brought all of us here together this uneasiness with what's happening in the world right now. Uh, if we felt at ease, we wouldn't feel compelled to be here, uh, other than, of course, for the delicious food that I'm really looking forward to afterwards. Uh, but there would be no compelling matter that's telling us to be here. And ultimately, as human beings, we are hardwired to desire peace, desire comfort, desire ease as opposed to discomfort, uneasiness, and conflict. We are hardwired to desire that. And in my faith tradition, it's, uh, peace does not simply mean to be at rest. And it does not simply mean to be living in some sorts of uh, compromise with someone else without a perfect understanding of them. That peace, as we understand it, is only to be conceived and to be established with a greater understanding of the creator, of the divine, and to understand that all creation came from that one single source, to find that ultimate comfort, that, uh, that sense of belonging in that divine, and knowing that the divine wouldn't have created other people that look different from us, wouldn't have created other people that sound different than us or believe differently than us if there wasn't some ultimate wisdom behind that. So relying, so deferring back to this, uh, this ultimate uh, source of truth, which we would define as different names, whether we refer to this creator as Allah or as Allah or as Yahweh or, uh, or any other name that people refer to, even some people don't, don't like to refer to it as a divine, just a power. Um, whatever is that ultimate source, knowing that we all find comfort in that same source. And in, in my tradition, the journey to peace begins with aligning our, our own personal attributes with, that, with the attributes of that, of that ultimate truth. Where in our tradition, God is defined as the most gracious, the most merciful, as the all-loving one, as the best of guides, as the protector, as the forgiver. There are known to be 99 different attributes, and I won't list them all uh, right now, uh, nor will there be a test. Um, but it, in, in Islam, we're, we're guided that your inner peace is defined by the extent to which your personal attributes can align with God's attributes. So how forgiving are you? How gracious are you with others? How much mercy do you extend to others? How much do you uh, try to extend your love to others? How much do you try to extend your guidance and your protection to others? That that's what inner peace means, is the greater extent to which our own characteristics can align with that of God's. And I think God is ultimately defined alike in pretty much all traditions. Um, we're taught that all traditions have a source to God. Uh, all people were sent a messenger. Uh, we're taught that even those that are in the deep jungles of Africa and the native populations all over the world have all been sent a messenger. Um, one of my favorite, ultimate favorite books was uh, uh, When Nations Gather, a book written by a Muslim 
defining prophets within the indigenous Native American population here in the United States, claiming that they are indeed prophets of God. Um, and so understanding that God is defined alike in all these different um, uh, traditions, uh, that, he, that God is ultimately universally true, compassionate, merciful, then the power of peace really for us and the challenge for us to establish peace is to see in others the same humanity that we see in ourselves. Uh, to see that same humanity that we would expect someone to see in our children uh, or in our parents or in our loved ones, the same humanity that I see in them. If I cannot see that same level of humanity in others, then, then there's something inherently wrong with me as an individual. Uh, and our tradition being taught that any religion that does not preach universal compassion is no religion. And any human being that does not encompass universal compassion is no human at all. Um, because that's what defines us and differentiates us from other of God's creatures. That we don't have this instinctive desire uh, to only take care of ourselves. That we have the capacity and we have the instinct of taking care of others as if they are from ourselves. Um, there's even, and within my faith, uh, there's even verses in our scripture. For example, there's a verse that says, Surely the believers, referring to the Muslims, and the Jews, and the Christians, and the Sabians, Sabians referring to those of non Abrahamic tradition, that whichever of these party truly believes in God and the last day and does good deeds, Surely they shall have the reward with their Lord, and no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. So getting to this point of, we can certainly talk about economic equality, social equality, um, personal equality, but when we talk about spiritual equality, this is something that's often left in the back burner. To still see, say that I want to take care of someone else, but ultimately, they're going to hell because they're not my religion. And so even if you feel like you, can, you have the compassion to take care of someone, but you ultimately have judged them as being spiritually inferior to you. Um, it's something that I see at least examples in other scriptures, but here I'm, uh, since I'm speaking from the Muslim perspective of my own scripture telling me to protect myself from that, that all people, as long as they believe, as long as they do good works, um, that no fear shall come upon them, that ultimately that they all have the opportunity of being saved by God, even if they don't accept my interpretation of faith. So basically the point I would drive towards is protecting ourselves from, being, from seeing ourselves as being chosen in any, in any way, whether it's because we own this land or I believe in this scripture or I believe in my guy, this prophet, um, to, to protect ourselves from feeling as if we're spiritually elevated than others. Um, because after all, how could you live in peace with someone if you think their God is different from yours? Or if you think their God is not real? Or if they are destined for hell simply because they adhere to a different faith? You cannot truly be at peace and live in peace while in that state of spiritual superiority. And I'm, although I'm sure this resonates with everyone here, because clearly you guys are not part of the problem. The, what, the images we saw in that video were not being committed by those that would leave their homes on a, sun, on a Sunday afternoon to come be in this, uh, in this auditorium. So the problem we see of violence and hate and hate speech against others is being implemented by the hands of those who don't come to events like this. So our job is to be change agents. Our job is that we are to be those seeds that are dispersed to our own areas of influence, our own circles, and not only plant ourselves in those circles, but then to continually till that soil, to continually water that soil until we nurture this seed and that it blossoms into a garden in our own area around us so that we don't need to gather here to feel like we're, we're spreading peace and love, that we feel it in our own circles. 
This is how we end hate speech. This is how we end violence. This is how we end the animosity that people hold towards one another. We have the ability, we have the power to influence that change. As long as we take that responsibility and that commitment upon ourselves as we leave these doors today to carry this forward so that it doesn't just die here. It takes the courage when I'm in my mosque, when I hear someone say something derogatory or even inflammatory or even abort, just even suspicious about someone of a different faith, a different race, a different gender, a different political association, having that courage to speak out, to say that I don't think you have the full truth. And I don't think that's what our, our creator is calling us towards. That's the power of peace that fosters the type of love and respect in our hearts. And I would close with a reflection from the founder of our community, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, who in the late 1800s had spoken about being sent uh, as, a, as a means to unite mankind. Not so that we all pretend like we're the same, uh, not so that we forget our differences, uh, but ultimately to understand the differences and to stick up for one another. Where he said, we belong to the same denomination of God's species and are referred to as humans. Furthermore, as inhabitants of the same country, we are mutual neighbors. This requires that we become friends to each other with purity of heart and sincerity of intentions. We should dispose kindly to each other and be mutually helpful. In the difficulties pertaining to religious and worldly matters, we should exercise such sympathy towards each other as we have become limbs of the same body. Thank you so much for your time and attention. to follow that. <clears throat> I don't think I have to say anything. He said it. <laughs> How many of you in this room, just raise your hand, have ever heard of the Sikh faith? Now, how many of you have ever met a Sikh? And how many of you know what a Sikh is? Less hands come up, right? Well, 45 years ago, I didn't either. I didn't. I was in a world religion class in Florida, and I had seen a Sikh, but I didn't know that's what he was. And my world religion professor, um, an amazing human being, had a, this was not a comparative religion class. This was a world religion class. This was a man who taught this class who was a former Methodist minister. He was no longer a Methodist minister. He was a soul, a man of spirit, seeking to honor all people of spirit. So at the age of 21, I sat in that auditorium that was in the round, and he had nine screens wrapped around in the room. And as those nine screens lit up, we experienced each world faith. There was a week when we came to his class, when I, and he also did it with music. So if we were in a Catholic church or in a Catholic a form of worship, we, were, we felt the presence of that music, the Latin Mass. When we were in a Baptist church, we heard the people praying and singing the hymns and the way they did it in that denomination. When we were in a mosque, and we were in the mosque, we were in Mecca, we felt the presence of the divine. When we were in a Hindu mandir, a Hindu temple, we felt the presence of the divine. And then one week, I saw the, the nine screens light up, and I was in the center of the Hari Mandir Sahib, the golden temple in Amritsar. I didn't know at that time that's what it was. I saw the word Sikh on the screen, and I heard the music, 
coming, the sacred music coming from the Gurdwara. I didn't even know what a Gurdwara was. But my heart was open. My spirit was awakened. Later, during the course of that semester, our professor announced that a yogi was coming to our school. He was invited as a guest, and he would be lecturing at 3 o'clock this afternoon and all of the class, and tell your friends to go and hear this yogi speak. So I went. And I had been studying a form of yoga since August, and it was now November. And it turns out it was the yoga that this yogi taught. I didn't know. All I heard was his name was Yogi. And he didn't play for the Yankees. <laughs> and so I sat there and I listened to this booming voice coming from this great teacher. And then I was invited by one of my fellow students in the college to come to her home and meet the yogi and have dinner with him. And then later that night, we would come back to the college and he would teach a class to us. I'll never forget that night. I'll never forget that experience of sitting with this incredibly quiet, humble man who had the projection of a lion. He was so powerful, yet so contained. I went to his class that night, and I breathed for the first time. I mean, I had been doing this form of yoga, but he, with him, it felt totally more expensive. So I want to ask you to sit up straight, and I'm going to give you just a simple, we're going to have an experience. The first mantra that I learned from this teacher was the word sat. We, it's, it's from the language of the Sikhs. It's, it's Gurmukhi. It's from the scripture. Sat means truth. It's also Sanskrit. Sat means truth. Not sat. Not sat. Sat. Okay, you say sat. Okay. And then another word was part of the mantra was nam. Does that word sound familiar to you in English? Nam? What is your nam? Right? That's where we get the word from. The Sanskrit nam means identity. So what is your identity? What is my identity? Sat, truth. So how do we discover what is the most universal thing that all of us are doing right now? Because our minds are wandering, our minds are remembering things. Did I lock the door? Oh, I hope the food is good tonight. Oh, I've never had Indian food. It's, I hope it's not too spicy. I mean, all of those things are happening. Oh, why do I have to cover my head? But now, the one thing that universally unites us is our breath. The Latin word for breath is spiritus. Spirit. So let us sit still and close our eyes and I want you to inhale through your nostrils and exhale through your nostrils. Just inhale, but as you're inhaling, as your eyes are closed, again, go to your heart center and say in your mind, sat, as you inhale. Inhale. And as you exhale, nam. Now inhale again. I mean, really inhale. And then exhale. Inhale one more time. Hold the breath. And exhale. Nam. We are one spirit. We are one truth. Our identity is truth. Guru Nanak Dave was born 30 years before this man, Columbus, 
arrived in the Caribbean. He was raised in a Hindu family, but at the age of 30, he began a number of journeys. He did several. He traveled more than any human being has ever traveled on foot, occasionally by boat. He was born in Punjab near Lahore, what is now Pakistan. He walked, my time's up, but I'm going to just give you a little bit more here. He walked with a traveling companion who was a Muslim. His name was Bai Mardana. They traveled everywhere. They went to Mecca, they went to Medina, they went to Kashmir, they went to Sri Lanka, they went to Nepal, they went to Tibet. And wherever they went, they honored all the faiths that they engaged. When Guru Nanak met a Muslim cleric or a Muslim, he greeted them as they greeted him. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. When he met the Hindu priest, he said, Namaste. When he met the Buddhist monk, he greeted the Buddhist monk in Tibet or Nepal as a Buddhist. But everywhere he blessed everyone with Sat Nam. He once went to a village with Mardana, and the people turned him away. They just wanted a place to rest, a place to refresh themselves to get some water, maybe some small food, but just to rest. And the people pushed them out and said, leave this place, we don't want you here. So Guru Nanak said, come Mardana, we will go to the next village. They went to the next village and the people welcomed them with hospitality, their hearts were open and they welcomed them. And they were bedded down for the night and when they awoke, they had some food and then as Guru Nanak left, he said to the divine, may these people scatter, may they not remain here, may they leave this place. I forgot to mention that when he left the other place, he said, may these people be blessed and may always remain here. <laughs> when Mardana heard the Guru say, you you blessed the people that cursed us, that banished us, that wouldn't give us hospitality, but yet you almost cursed these people who said, come to our homes, we'll share everything with you. He said, that's true. I want those people to stay right where they are, and I want these people to spread that love everywhere. And that's what the Sikh faith is. There are somewhere between 30 and 50 million Sikhs in the world. It's the fifth largest world faith. The fifth. From 30 million, you have to go up to about 400 million, and that's how many Buddhists there are. So there's a big jump. And if you go up a little bit more, you get to a billion Hindus. And if you go up a little higher, you're, a, you're also over a billion Muslims. And if you go a little higher, or a billion and a half Muslims, and you go a little higher, it's two and a half billion people calling themselves followers of the Christ. Right? They're all over the place. Most of them are Roman Catholic, but not in this country. So I want to end by showing you, tell, reminding you of some things that have happened because we talk about things that happen in Rwanda and happen in other countries and happen in, you know, the hate and the violence. But since September 11, 2001, 700 Sikhs have been either killed or beaten, lost a loved one. The first one was on September 15th in Mesa, Arizona, outside of Phoenix, when a humble man who was loved by his community was planting some flowers and a man drove by and shot him in the head. That man's name was Balbir Singh Sodi. A, couple, a year later, in Daly City, California, Balbir Singh Sodi's brother, a taxicab driver, in Daly City, California, was also murdered. Imagine that. Two brothers. One in California, one in Arizona. There are many more that happened. And then, 
While we were all sitting ready to go to church on Sunday, the 5th of August, 2012, and some of us were watching the Olympics on NBC and MSNBC, because that's where it was being shown. I was on my way to the Gurdwara in Eugene with my daughters and my grandchildren. And my daughter, my one daughter called down from above where she lived up on the hill and she said, turn on CNN, it's the only channel that it's on. And we turned to CNN and the Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin had been attacked by a gunman and killed six people. The hero that day was a police officer Lieutenant Murphy, a white Christian minister, uh, uh, police officer who took many, many bullets from an automatic weapon and lived. There's not a Sikh on this planet Earth who doesn't know who Lieutenant Murphy is. But what happened afterwards, and CNN got to cover it the entire week. Nobody else would cover it. Everybody else had other you know, priorities. But they got to cover it. So for a week, if you were watching it, you got to learn a little bit more about Sikhs. And then it passes away. A couple of weeks ago, another Sikh was stopped at a truck stop, was taken out of his vehicle, almost lost his eye, had his turban removed and his hair cut. The most sacred thing to a Sikh is his unshorn hair, or her unshorn hair. The FBI has now ruled that a hate crime. So there'll be a beginning of that. We know what happened in South Carolina last summer when the African American historical church was attacked and nine people were killed, six of whom were women. There's a similarity between the Gurdwara in Wisconsin and the African American church in South Carolina. The similarity is not that all those people were murdered by a white man who called himself a Christian. No, the similarity was the compassion that the Sikh community and the African American community showed humanity, showed America showed all of us of all faiths how you treat someone who comes in and murders your family, kills your minister. We saw something happen very symbolic right after that in South Carolina, in Columbia, South Carolina. We saw the removal of a hate symbol from a flagpole. It was just a symbol. It was done by people who decided enough is enough. They were Republicans, they were Democrats, they were Protestants, they were Catholics, they were Jews, they were black, they were white. That's what we're faced with in this world that we are in today. And Harris is right. As we leave here today, we all know this is the choir. The choir needs to go forth, as Guru Nanak said to that community, scatter around this land and spread that love, spread that kindness. And these are the words of Guru Nanak. Say these words, Cherdi, it's just a sound, Cherdi, Kala. May your spirit rise. And as that yogi said so long ago, that teacher I met in 1971, if you can't see God in all, you can't see God Thank you. Well, it was just a minute or so over eight minutes. Um, ten minutes, right? Yeah, about ten. Um, I'm Sharif Abdullah, and um, for those of you who know me, uh, restricting me to an eight-minute time slot is going to be really interesting. <laughs> Um, and um, I want to um, uh, say it, it's all, I always find it interesting when I'm on a panel uh, serving uh, in the capacity that, that's, that's working on 
religious or interreligious or transreligious issues that um, I don't so much represent a religion as a perspective. And that perspective is the perspective of inclusivity. And that thing is, should be the guiding element of all religions. It actually is, it can be, sometimes it is, and then sometimes it isn't. As we've said up here, we're, we're preaching to the choir, but I have an interesting uh, capacity that I get to talk to and work with and try consciousness transformation with the very people that we've been talking about as the um, uh, perpetrators of hate crimes. About a week or so ago, um, and in the context of doing this, I'm, um, uh, my organization, Commonway Institute, is hired uh, by various organizations um, to help them understand the concept of inclusivity inside their organization or help them help to do training to how to um, remove the concept of exclusivity um, in, uh, from the organization. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in a southern city that can't be named on tape, um, and a, I'm sorry, southern Oregon city, and um, I was hired by the city because their um, city workers had been uh, documented um, with uh, amazingly hateful speech towards um, different people of different ethnicities, uh, specifically uh, Mexicans, and people of different religions, specifically Muslims. And um, I'm working with them, and this is not the first time I'm working with them. And um, yeah, I'm working in a room with 60 predominantly men, predominantly overwhelmingly white, and I can guarantee you there's not one Hillary Clinton voter in, the, in that room. <laughs> and I'm working on the concept of inclusivity and how they just simply can't do the things that they've been doing. And I was, was um, uh, confronted by one of the guys, and he was, was struggling. You could see him struggling with the concept. And he just said to me, he said, why can't I say this? Why can't I do this? How come this is not the truth? He doesn't know that a Harris is a far exists. The only thing he knows about Muslims is what he was told by the news media, and those are the people who throw bombs and kill children. And if that's all you know, then why not have this, this attitude? And so I, I want us to be careful in throwing around this term called hate crimes because it really is a matter of your consciousness and a matter of perspective. So as the, the in the cleanup seat um, uh, at the, uh, on the panel, um, I get to answer a question that we should have asked earlier on, which is, what is a hate crime? Now, if you follow the federal government guidelines, definitions, you know that there are certain protected classifications of people and saying things that disparage or taking acts that injure or kill people and those particular classes of people is a hate crime. And I think that a hate crime is a lot more simple and a lot more pervasive than that. A hate crime is simply the opposite of inclusivity. A hate crime is when you other anyone else. Yeah. A, a hate crime exists when you are othering anyone else, including othering yourself. 
Now, when uh, I, I wrote a, a book um, this year, last year, um, called Practicing Inclusivity, and if you go to Amazon, you can get it. And I talk about the classifications of practicing inclusivity, but these are also the same classifications where you can the, uh, the, of practicing hate. You can practice hate with yourself. And how many of us know people who hate themselves? How many of us in this room have practiced hate toward ourselves? Okay, who have judged ourselves as being wrong or bad or deficient in some way? We can, we can practice inclusivity, but we also can practice hate with our intimates, with our, our husbands, our wives, with our children. Um, Andrew Young was um, asked during the, 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 the heyday of the um, civil rights movement how he can be nonviolent to the Ku Klux Klan. And he thought about it and he said, Practicing nonviolence with the Ku Klux Klan is easy. I don't know if I can practice nonviolence with my children. Okay? So the third level is, practicing, is, is inclusivity with the other or hatred to the other. And that's the place that we, we tend to focus on. But I would say if you don't get to these other levels first, including that hatred of yourself, you can't get to the point where you're practicing inclusivity with the other. So what's the path that ends the hate crimes? What's the path that actually can end that violence? That path is the path of transformation and the path of metamorphosis. And I think this is something that we talk about, but unless you, you do the deep work that we do in our Common Way sessions, you don't get to the root of our society is not changing, it is transforming. And just as a caterpillar is an eating machine that eats and eats and eats as much as it possible, and when it gets its call, attaches its butt to a, tw a twig, turns into a chrysalis, and out pops something completely different. Many of us, and I, was, I would be willing to, I would be ch challenging my, my fellow panelists on, uh, from the climate change panelists, panel, when, we are talk, when they're talking about dealing with the effects of climate change, how many of them in their minds were seeing a fundamentally different society? Or how many of them saw the, uh, the existing society as doing the things that we're normally doing, but we're driving Priuses? Okay, so, so this issue of metamorphosis, of getting one with that metamorphosis, my Native American friends were talking about decolonization, but with, to, in order to decolonize this society, you're basically going to have a completely different society. And so that, that place of decolonization starts with me. It starts with each of you. Um, generally, when we talk about climate change or we talk about getting rid of hate crimes, etc., we're looking at everybody else. We want them to change. I'm okay. We, oh, we're okay. <laughs> yeah. And so the challenge that we've got, if we're going to end the, the, go, uh, stop the, the violence and stop the hate crimes, is to go down that path of transformation and to envision a fundamentally different society, to, and, and then to start working on that fundamentally different society. I'll say this, um, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing well here and I'm gonna end in a minute or so. Um, what does religion have to do with hate crimes? Well, first of all, religions are the perpetrators of hate crimes. Second of all, religions are and can be the solution to the hate crimes. You, we're wielding a two-edged sword and the question is whether or not we are going to, to either be a bastion of inclusivity or a bastion of exclusivity. Whether or not we're going to own our own past 
and own the past of our organizations, steeped in blood, steeped in hatred? Or are we going to sweep all that under the, under the rug and say, oh, everything is just wonderful and America's number one? Are we going to envision a collective future and a future that exists for all of us and so that our, our spiritual expression is more than what, uh, what Zafar was saying, hi, how are you doing? And you're gonna go to hell, okay? That, that what we have to do is look at what that means and how that means it. That that visioning process starts with you, it starts with your spiritual values, and it starts with be, us being able to let go of the status quo and embrace a completely different reality. And needless to say, I got a lot more to say, but I'm going to stop right there. Wow. I love hanging out with brilliant people, and I'm having a good time right now. I don't know about you. This is magnificent. Uh, let me just do a quick process check. How much time do we have for Q&A? <laughs> None, okay. <laughs> this is a good time to remind you that they actually built in time for Q&A with all of the panelists from uh, today during the, the meal time. Uh, so we'll eat and you'll have a chance to, uh, to interact with all of the wonderful panelists. Uh, do, I, do I have time to make some closing comments? Okay. Uh, well, as I was listening to all of the other panels and these uh, fine folks up here, so many things coming through my mind uh, that, you know, I think what it, it, it occurs to me that there's a, a, an approach that we should take out of today, uh, a threefold approach. When we look at hate, discrimination, uh, the environment, all of these things that we've been discussing today, a reclaiming of our indigenous voice, uh, the decolonization of not only uh, uh, our external world, but the decolonization of our mind, the decolonization, decolonization of our thoughts, the, the reclamation or reclaiming of our authentic nature and our spiritual truth. I'm reminded of the words of um, uh, my colleague, uh, Reverend uh, Tara Wilkins, who's the executive director of the Community of Welcoming Congregations, another board that I have served on. And that organization uh, was a, a pivotal uh, force in changing the conversation in Oregon and Southwest Washington on the issue of marriage equality. And the way that we did it was we literally changed the conversation because the conversation had become polarized about politics. You were either liberal and you were for marriage equality or you were something else and against it. And we came in from a faith-based approach and said we have to reclaim the notion that love is a principle. It is a spiritual principle, not a political football. And so let's stop playing political football with it and let's reclaim it as something that we all have in common with each other. And let's make the conversation, not are you for or against and not what Bible passage do you read to justify your position or any of those other things, but rather tell me about love. And we actually worked with faith communities and we actually charged people to go out and meet with their neighbors and talk with their friends and their coworkers and to have a conversation about love, to have a conversation about the common principle to reclaim, and, and so that I think there are a lot of things that become polarized and become politicized, but they're not political. They're human rights issues, they're humanity issues, they're environmental issues, they're issues that are common to the core of who we are as human beings. And we have to have, the, we have to reclaim those conversations. And so uh, I remember hearing once Reverend Tara Wilkins actually speaking in our community about her, her work in this. And she said, you know, I did not get into this work because, uh, because I'm a lesbian. I did not get into this work because I'm a same gender loving uh, person who's called to the ministry. I got into this work because what I heard was people lying about God. Stop lying about God. Let's, you, know, you, can't, you can't define the infinite. Religion is, all religion is the language of metaphor. It is by its nature limited. And so the moment we start defining what it is or what it isn't, we've already lost. Even the word infinite has a definition. That should be your first clue, that we're not quite going to get there, 
right? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So we have to, to reclaim spiritual truth, and we have to reclaim the notion that we belong to each other. And I think that that's what you heard throughout the panels today. The, the common thread that I'm walking away with is that of remembering that sacred covenant that we belong to each other. So we speak up against voices of hate and discrimination by simply saying, stop lying about God. Reclaim the spiritual truth of who we are with each other uh, to speak up against systematic structures of oppression uh, And most importantly to do that inner work to remove it from ourselves to remove it from our own consciousness and our own heart through listening and compassion and and Getting to know the other and all of these wonderful ways that we have uh, heard for me I would summarize that as simply reclaiming the prophetic voice of transcendence and inclusion Every spiritual tradition has a prophetic voice of transcendence and inclusion, and it talks about uh, how we belong to one another. We need to reclaim that voice for ourselves and start using it. Uh, and if I can, um, there's a poem that, um, can I just, can I close out the session with a prayer? Would that be okay? Would that be all right? I mean, so I'm going to invite you to take a deep, deep breath. I'm going to use a poem that uh, came to me as I was listening to one of the other panels uh, as a way to just sort of launch into the space of, of prayer and we'll bless our meal and, and the rest of our uh, time together. Can we give another quick hand for all of our panelists? Really brilliant. So I invite you to take a deep breath. Turn within. Tune into that presence of divine love and wisdom that infinite source, or whatever name you call it. And I begin by setting the tone from a poem whose author I don't recall in this moment, but we give them credit in the infinite. And it says this, six people trapped by happenstance in black and bitter cold. Each one held a stick of wood, or so the story is told. Their dying fire in need of logs, the first man held his back. For on the faces around the fire, he noticed that one was black. The next man looked round the group and saw not one from his church and could not bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. The next man sat in tattered clothes and gave his coat a hitch. Why should his stick be put to use? to warm the idle rich. The rich man sat and looked around and thought of the wealth that he had in store and how he could keep what he had earned from the lazy and shiftless poor. The next man gave to only to those who gave was how he played the game. And the black man's face bespoke of revenge as the fire passed from sight, for all he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. The logs held tight in death's still hands was proof of human sin. They did not die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. And so tonight, what I know about this body of people, what I know about the wisdom that has been spoken in this place, is the fire of compassion, the fire of love, the fire of our common humanity, our common connection has been stoked and fueled by our connection, by our willingness to listen to the voices of the other, by our willingness to open up and to see and to feel and to sense that common thread of truth. And tonight that fire burns brightly and it is now our task to go and give this flame to another, to pass it on through our voices, through our presence in our workplaces, in our families, in our communities, and together to continue the fire going, the fire that cannot be put out by any hate or speech, cannot be put out by any voice of discrimination or otherness. The fire and that flame that is eternal, that is found in every truth, in every religion, in every temple, in every mosque, in every synagogue, in every place of worship, wherever two or more are gathered together, seeking sincerely the divine and the transcendent. And so I simply affirm and know that that activity is taking place in your heart and my heart. And that while we are the choir, we are a strong choir. 
And the principle of love cannot be put out by the politics of hate. We know this, we practice this, and we allow this to be our presence in the community and expect a transformation, a radical transformation of the world in which we live. We do not seek to change the world. We seek to reveal the world that we know is possible for ourselves and for our children and for our grandchildren and for seven generations down the line. This I affirm and know. And in that affirmation, I bless the food. I bless the sacredness of our time together and the music and the rest of our conversation and connection in this great space. And I simply let it go and allow it to be. Amen, amin, Allah, ashe. And so it is.